Profiles in Cinemania, in memoriam, Donald Sutherland. At six foot four, Donald Sutherland towered over nearly every actor he shared the stage and screen with, silver or otherwise. In much the same way that his career towered over the last 60 years of film and television, or that his forehead towered over his brooding, gloomy eyes. He defied the traditions of Hollywood as a leading man, with the looks of a character actor, and a face that even his mother admitted couldn't be called handsome. But at least it was interesting. In his first big break, as one of the Dirty Dozen, his non-speaking role became the scene-stealing cut-up Pinkley, after the original actor refused the scene, and famed director Robert Aldrich singled Donald out for greatness by shouting, You! With the big ears! You say it! It pays to look a little weird, and Donald Sutherland played it to his advantage, slouching his way from endearing to menacing in role after role, sometimes both at the same time. His iconic posture was actually a sign of his commitment, he bent over just so his less vertically endowed scene partners could look him in the eye. He may have lost one role because, according to the producer, it calls for a guy next door type. And you don't look like you've lived next door to anyone. But it earned him the attention of Federico Fellini, who had cast no one but Donald Sutherland as the fascist Lothario because he looked like, and I'm absolutely not making this up, a sperm-filled waxwork with the eyes of a masturbator. End quote. Which honestly says more about the mind of the sayer than the sayee. And when the grand scheme of the great train robbery requires someone to play a corpse, you gotta know who it's gonna be. Yes, no one could alternatively ooze charm and repulsion quite like Donald Sutherland. A clear sign of cinemania. But can we blame him? This was a man who had been subjected to every format in the performing arts. For our more prolific profiles, we love to crack wise by rattling off a long list of credits at alarming speed. But for Donald Sutherland and his over 200 credits, we have to do that for all the genres he appeared in. Comedy, war, anti-war, romance, rom-com, crime, heist, drama, historical drama, historical everything, thriller, action, science fiction, fantasy, classic horror, creature feature, psychological horror, body horror, existential horror, noir, neo-noir, psycho-noir, spy thriller, erotic thriller, erotic horror, back to horror, music video, newscast, blog, NSA watch list, stage film, television, animation, voiceover, Eurovision narration, and Olympic ceremony. That kind of genre whiplash would drive anyone to Cinemania. Ironic that such a literal titan of Hollywood, who birthed a dynasty of titans, was not born into it himself. Donald McNichol Sutherland was born in 1935 in New Brunswick, Canada, to a salesman and a school teacher. He got his first industry gig at just 14 as a news correspondent for the local radio station. While he studied engineering in college at his parents' insistence, that didn't slow him down much, and immediately upon graduation, he was off to the famed Lambda, London Academy of Musical and Dramatic Arts. He spent time treading boards and television screens across England until his first film role in 1964, alongside, no big deal, Christopher Lee in Castle of the Living Dead. That opened up the world of horror films to him, including a number of Hammer films like Die, Die, My Darling, opposite Tallulah Bankhead. As he noted to The Guardian in a 2005 interview, I was always cast as an artistic homicidal maniac, but at least I was artistic. But as we all learned, no one puts Donnie in a corner. His enormous ears earned him his first break in The Dirty Dozen in 1967, and this garnered him two more roles in 1970 on military-themed black comedies. First, he played the wisecracking hippie Oddball in Kelly's Heroes, a character best known for complaining to Gavin MacLeod's Moriarty about his negative waves. Those waves couldn't have been too negative, though, because MacLeod went on to play Captain Steubing in The Love Boat. But I digress. The other, more consequential role was when Sutherland played the original Hawkeye in Robert Altman's M.A.S.H., the role later inhabited by Alan Alda of a television spin-off. There are so many films in Sutherland's long shadow, and we're not going to try to list even the highlights. For most of his 60-year career, he racked up multiple credits every single year, including up to the year he died. Whole generations know him differently, depending on the kinds of iconic roles he happened to play in their childhoods. Maybe you know him most as a disturbed and disturbing leading man from 70s thrillers like Clute and Don't Look Now or as an outright sadistic monster from Lockup or Fellini's Casanova in the 80s, or as an upper-crust slimeball in the early 90s from Six Degrees of Separation or Disclosure. You might know him as a more dignified, even gentle man from his mid-90s and early aughts roles in Time to Kill, 
Cold Mountain or the Kira Knightley Pride and Prejudice. And more recently, he returned to the comfortable villain role in the entire goddamn Hunger Games trilogy. No big deal. While he focused primarily on his acting career, Donald Sutherland also took a brief turn to political activism when he met the famous, or infamous, depending on your perspective, anti-war celebrity Jane Fonda. They starred together in Clue and immediately began an affair. For several years after, they toured military bases in the Pacific Rim with several other actors as the FTA, alternately known as the Free Theater Associates, Free the Army, or Fuck the Army, depending on who you ask. They performed satirical anti-war sketches as an alternative to Bob Hope's more patriotic USO tour, and produced a documentary about the troop and shows in 1972. This earned Sutherland a spot on both the FBI and NSA watch lists. He was also a vocal opponent to the Iraq invasion in 2003, and wrote pro-Obama blogs for the Huffington Post during the 2008 elections. Now, while Jane Fonda may have come from Hollywood royalty, over the course of three marriages, Donald Sutherland birthed his own dynasty of more workmanlike actors and producers that formed the backbone of film, and he named them all after his favorite directors, including the man who gave him his first role in The Castle of the Living Dead, Warren Kiefer. Because you're right, Kiefer is a really weird first name. And what about awards? Between nominations and wins, Donald is rocking nine Golden Globes, two Emmys, a BAFTA, three different critics associations, a Walk of Fame star in both Hollywood and Canada, and an officer in the Order of Canada, which is a lot like Patrick Stewart getting knighted in Britain, but with more maple syrup entitlements and uh, you don't have to strap on a bunch of armor and go to war if the Queen decides she's had enough of Angela Merkel's bullshit. But for all of that, and having starred in several Oscar-winning and nominated films, including the outstanding 1980 film Ordinary People, the tiny golden man completely eluded him until 2017, when he was awarded an honorary Oscar for Lifetime Achievement. He almost didn't take the call, because he didn't recognize the number and figured it was a scam, which, not saying anything, but uh, just saying. Donald Sutherland died on June 18th, 2024, after a long, undisclosed illness, the lofty age of 88. And he was still working on the TV show Lawmen, Bass Reeves. Within 24 hours, just about every major celebrity in the last 40 years had shared their fond memories, accolades, and tributes to one of the most significant actors of all time. But his son probably put it best. Never daunted by a role, good, bad, or ugly, he loved what he did, and he did what he loved. And one can never ask for more than that, a life well lived. This has been another Profile in Cinemania. This episode was written and performed by Daniel Scribner. Music by Meteor at meteormusic.bandcamp.com. Profiles in Cinemania is a product of the Cinemania Society, LLC.